Well, folks, you hear, heard it here first. We're bringing a gong <laughs> thanks to Lisa Song Sutton. Well, Welcome. It's so, <laughs> such a good idea. You're the entrepreneur queen. So, Lisa Song Sutton, thank you for coming on A Better Life with Brandon Turner. Thank you so much for having me. I am pumped about this because you are somebody that I not only follow but look up to a lot online because you are, uh, you kill it at everything that you do. And so I want to get into that. So thanks for being here. Thank you so much. All right. So I know you as, uh, first of all, I know you as a real estate investor because we were on a panel together. I think it was at Limitless last year. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you as an entrepreneur. I know you do some amazing stuff with like mailboxes I want to dig into later. And you got a really cool system there that almost nobody's heard of. Uh, you are former Miss Nevada. Like that's a cool thing. I want to talk about pageants a little bit today. Yes. And uh, why you did that, what it brought out. Uh, so I know all that about you. And I know you're a VC chick is that a weird phrase like vc girl <laughs> i don't know vc lady venture capitalist uh you are an entrepreneur but take us back before all that who was lisa song sutton yes yeah, so uh, well my business career started in law actually okay um and I oh, worked, you were a lawyer mm -hmm, wow. and i worked in business litigation and business bankruptcy so that was like the best precursor I could have had before getting actually into business. Yeah. Because you had a chance to meet a lot of really, really smart, interesting people who were coming in and you were just like, how did you get mm. here? Um, and you start reverse engineering some circumstances and you find out six months into their seven year business, they never papered up and signed their operating agreement with a partner. <laughs> or just, you know, so, so like one thing, right? We were just like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Like if you would have done that, the trajectory of the business would have changed forever. 100%. Why did you Why did you decide to be a lawyer originally? Like, what What brought that on? Yeah, well, I'm the product of an Asian tiger mom. So, <laughs> <laughs> so by the time I was in middle school, my mom was like, so you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer? And mm. I was like, okay. Yep. Um, and so I did. I decided to go to law school. And even though I didn't stay in law, much to the chagrin of my mm. parents at first, um, I'm so glad that I went because not only... Did it give me an incredible background in education, but also the network of people that you meet. Mm. Everyone that I went to law school with, now I've been out of school, oh my gosh, 13 years. And everyone I went, went to law school You went to school when with, you were 12? No. Wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, everyone I went to law school with now, they're either partners at their firm or they own their own firm or they're in business mm. and they're just absolutely crushing it. So how incredible that you have a Rolodex of people that you yeah. can just call at any time. Yeah, that's awesome. But you didn't stay in law. So what happened that got, took you out of that? Totally by accident. Um, when I was working at the firm, this is two years in, I was just working my big girl job and kind of felt like I had like made it. Like I, I did the right thing, right? I went to college, went to law school, got out, got a good job. Um, so my parents were like, okay, next. You know what I mean? Like now you just need to get married and have babies. Yes. And like your life is <laughs> with a bow on it, you know? <laughs> And um, two years into working at the firm, um, my uh, co-founder at the time, um, we started Sin City Cupcakes. Mm. And it was totally by chance. Um, Danielle had told me she was making these alcohol-infused cupcakes. And I'm like, that's an amazing idea. <laughs> and we need to do it in Vegas. So I made all the mistakes in the beginning that a founder makes, right? I literally was like, move into my house. I just bought a house in Summerlin. I'm like, move into my house. We will start the company here. We started baking in my home kitchen in <laughs> Summerlin. <laughs> Such a disaster. I didn't even know how to bake mm. when we started the company, but I just knew that it was a good idea. And I was like, how much fun is this going to be? And so I stayed working full time at my job because businesses take money. So literally all my free cash I was just funneling it right into the business to get it started and then um, Danielle was taking care of day-to-day -day operations during the workday and then nights and weekends I was helping her bake I was running deliveries I was setting up events I was literally working seven days a week between my full-time day job and running the business but I had so much fun mm, that's cool yes that and that's still around today right yeah yeah mm -hmm. did you guys sell it or did you, did you still own it yeah so we're in the middle of an M&A right now oh, no so, way yeah it's exciting. That's awesome. Yeah, but like cupcakes were like, did you know? I mean, was it just an intuition? You're like, I think this is going to be the next big thing or because that like how long ago was that? That would have been what? 10 years ago ish. This was 11 years ago. Okay, cupcakes mm -hmm. have really blown up. I feel like over the last few years. But did you get that early or did you see what other people were doing? And you just so, like, hey, this is what they're doing. Yeah. So this is after like Magnolia Bakery took off like on Sex in the City. I mean, this okay. is like we're talking back in the day. Yeah. And so. This was right when food trucks started to become popular in mm. Vegas. It's like two, 2012. Yeah. And so we were like, 
we should have like a cupcake truck. Mm. And so we bought a sprinter van <laughs> <laughs> and like decked it out and turned it into a cupcake truck. And so we would use that for execution on like big catering events or the food festivals. And let's face it, it was mostly just us like drinking wine and like mm -hmm. trying to get people to buy cupcakes. Yeah. Like it was so much fun and crazy. That's cool. So what lessons did you learn that you could teach people today that are listening to this about like they have an idea and maybe it's a crazy idea of like, I'm going to do alcohol infused cupcakes. Like what can you tell them that you wish you would have been told when you got started? Don't be scared to just try it, right? Because I think, you know, everyone has a different level of risk tolerance. But for me, I felt like I did it. Um, in a very comfortable way in the sense that I didn't just quit my job cold turkey. And I think you have a lot of people who are like, you have to go all in, otherwise you're not serious in this yeah. and that. Well, guess what? I wasn't serious about it. It was a side hustle, mm, right? Yeah. I wasn't serious. I had a good day job with benefits. So I was like, well, you know, clearly I'm not just going to like cut that off cold turkey because I have an operational partner. Yeah. So that's like a huge key piece. And that was something I learned early from that endeavor. And I've replicated that ever since I've always had an operational partner in yeah. everything that I do. Uh, can you explain operational partner? I mean, I, I, like it sounds obvious as a partner who operates, but what does that look like on a day to day and how do you find that person? Yeah. So this person is someone who is um, an equity partner in the company, meaning that they have a piece of the company as well. And, um, part of how they're earning that equity is through what's called sweat equity, where they are putting in their time, um, perhaps to run it day to day or to be the main point person for the company um, in exchange for part ownership in the company. And then you are bringing, maybe you're bringing the finances, maybe you're bringing the legal know-how, maybe you're bringing mm. connections to a location, whatever it is that you're bringing, um, there's something of value being exchanged there as well. Yeah. So this applies to real estate uh, definitely as well. And I know you, you do some real estate. We'll talk about that. But when I got started in real estate, I remember my first like partnership ever, I had a, a, a basically yeah, a triplex. It was like three little houses on one lot. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to buy it. It was one of my first, one of my first multifamilies and I wanted to buy it, but it had no money. And so I became the operating partner. Mm -hmm. uh, I operated the deal. I found it. I put it together. I managed everything. And I found a, a buddy of mine who I went to church with and him and his wife, they had some cash. They actually had a line of credit on their house, like a home equity line Perfect. of credit. So yeah. they funded it. Uh, it was like 30 grand maybe. And then we split everything at the end of the day, 50, 50. Amazing. And it worked out perfect. That's so great. But then here's what's funny. I love whenever I tell this story to people, I get one of two answers. Well, why would you give them 50% if you're doing all the work? And then, other people say, well, why would they give you 50% mm -hmm. if they put all the money? And I'm like, that's funny. Like, <laughs> that's a, what a partnership, that's what a partnership is. does. Yeah. <laughs> You're that's right. Like, it is. Yeah. That's, and it works out. It worked out great for them. They didn't have to do any work. And they made, I mean, they made a, well over a hundred grand on that investment, like over the course of the decade we Amazing. held it. Yeah, they yeah. did great. They got their money back actually pretty quickly. And then they just made profit long term. And, and so like, this is the beauty of a partnership yes. is that you have some people who have cash, some people who can do the work and both people can win. 100%. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's also a misnomer too. You know, when you say you're partnering up with someone or if you pitch someone to be an operational partner, um, it's not necessarily that you have to give up 50% yeah. right off the bat, yeah. right? Like I've done endeavors where um, there's tiered up metrics over time, right? And as an equity partner, maybe you start at five or 10%, yep. but with certain metrics that are hit and as time goes on, that can scale up and eventually maybe you get to 50%, yeah. but there's so many different ways to structure it. And that's the beauty of a, a partnership contract is you can really create it however you'd like, as long as you have a mutual agreement. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. I think people tend to, and I, I know I, I have just fall into 50, 50 cause it sounds fair, Sure, but it doesn't have to be, it can be whatever yeah. you want it to be. And it mm -hmm. can be dependent on how much they're bringing or how many partners you have. Mm -hmm. And so it probably just a good lesson for people is yeah, maybe put a little bit more work into that. I mean, when I think about, this is going to be the, the biggest financial, I don't want to call it a mistake in any way, but the biggest financial decision I ever made in my entire life was, and it'll cost me probably a billion dollars. Uh, and it's not a bad thing, but it was, it was a decision that I put less work into than picking out like my breakfast that day. Mm -hmm. And it was how I was going to divvy up equity at Open Door Capital. I mean, Open Door Capital, we already own almost a billion dollars of real estate. We're aiming to, we want to own $10 billion in 10 years. Mm -hmm. That 10 billion will turn into 15, you know, maybe plus yeah. billion. That gets divided up over investors and all my partners at the company. So the way that I just determined was was super like, well, what do you think you should get? Okay, let's do that. Well, let's, let's do that. And I just like throw out equity like I was, yeah, picking like my, my Santa breakfast. Claus. Yeah, the Santa Claus yeah. of equity. Yep. And it's <laughs> or so, the Oprah of equity. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> you get some. And yeah, you get, get some. some. You get some. You get some equity. And <laughs> oh, I know Brandon. I love giving equity. I have yeah. zero regrets about Same. giving the equity. Yeah. 
but it's funny the lack of a, like I didn't ask one person one person what I should do for giving equity I didn't have one conversation like, with what a, are you somebody. getting in exchange yeah like yeah oh. I didn't I didn't have any of that I didn't ask um I didn't I didn't say is there v- vesting in there right. I didn't do yeah. I mean it, it worked out really well. Like I love the fact that my team has like, they end up owning 58% of my company. Amazing. Like it's great. They yeah. work so hard and I, have, I don't have to work hardly at all at it. It's wonderful. But like, why didn't I call up anybody smart who had been doing this for a decade and been like, can I just ask you some advice? Yeah. Like what would you give for <laughs> equity? And so it's- What it, would you recommend? Yeah, what yeah. would you recommend? It was, it's a billion dollar decision and I wow. made it on a whim. And it's a, it worked out well for me, but my warning to other people is maybe put a little more work 100%. into thinking about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Don't it's just, just an 50/50. easy conversation. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's so true. All right, so how did you go from now I'm lawyer with a cupcake company Mm -hmm. uh, and then later you're Miss Nevada? Like how did that transition or where did that come from? So totally unrelated to the business journey, um, but common denominator, my mom. My mom is a former Miss Korea. Oh, really? Yeah, and so she called me the fall of 2013 and she's like, are you competing for Miss Las Vegas? And I was like, I don't know, I'm busy. I just started a company. And she's like, um, you're getting ready to age out. So I was like, <laughs> so I woke up one day, I'm like aging out of pageantry and modeling. Um, who knew? Um, and so I, I had to buckle down and I hired a pageant coach. That's a thing. I did not know that. That is a thing. So, I mean, in anything in life, right? Any endeavor that you have, there's going to be a professional theoretically yeah. that you could hire to help you. So I hired a pageant coach and uh, this guy, his name was Bill Alverson. Um, they called him the Nick Saban of pageant coaching. Mm. He's from Alabama and he only like coached winners, right? <laughs> Very intense uh, application process. He actually denied me the first time because he was like, you're too short and like small. He oh, was really? like, I don't know what's going on here. And I was just like, <laughs> ah, you know, like what's happening? Um, I convinced him to work with me. And um, so he just said, look, he was like, I'm going to be real with you. He was like, you're too short and like you're small. He is like, the only thing you have going for you is like how smart you are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, okay. so, I think. <laughs> yeah. And so he's like, we just have to double down on your strengths. And I was like, okay, let's go, let's do it. And we, um, very intensely worked on interview. Mm. So, um, our strategy was if I could get the judges to fall in love with me during private interview, which is the first phase of competition in the pageant, then um, I'd be able to really just kind of show up at uh, on stage and hopefully the other girls are going to be vapid in interview and um, I could at least sail to on stage question and mm. then nail on stage question that would that would be like nail in the coffin I could win. Um, and so his b- big thing was, you know, you got to figure out why you're competing in the first place. He was like, it's not enough that like, you know, your mom thinks you should compete. He was like, you, you need to decide why you're competing and let's get to that. And I realized I was the oldest contestant in the Miss Division that year. I was 28 years old. So I was competing against women. 20 to 29 is the age division. So I was competing against women who were in their 20, 21, early 20s. Um, So a totally different stage in life. I had already finished school. I was a working professional. I was a business owner. And so I decided um, my why for competing was that I really wanted to make an impact in the community. I really wanted to ingratiate myself in the Las Vegas community. And if I had the chance to win Miss Nevada, I would do as much work as I could to represent the state as best as I could and do as much community work as I could. So heading into the state pageant, I had the title of Miss Las Vegas for I think four months heading into Miss Nevada. I had already done 60 appearances, community appearances, Mm. um, heading into the pageant. So I was able in interview to talk about what I've already been doing as opposed to, oh, why do you want to win? Well, if I win, then I want to do this, this, and this. I was like, actually i've already been doing this this and this with all these other nonprofits. if i can win i would love to continue that work elevated on a state level and and that was um my way of showing that like i'm not just gonna talk the talk i'm gonna walk the walk Mm. yeah that makes uh a lot of sense what were the 60 appearances like what does that mean before the pack because it's not like they were like you weren't miss nevada so what, what right. were they having you appear for what were you appear what, what was that about yeah so i had a local title as miss las vegas which is oh, okay i had more international press as miss las vegas than i got than i got as miss nevada which is hilarious oh, but 
Um, it was just uh, community appearances. So okay. whether it was reading in schools, volunteering in hospitals, uh, volunteering at red carpets, volunteering at every gala under the sun. Uh, you know, I was like the silent auction girl, you know, I'm like oh, holding funny. things. Or, <laughs> yeah, you're just kind of Vanna White style, yeah. you know. Um, you're checking in people with tickets, whatever it is. Um, you're just there to help that nonprofit with whatever they needed. Okay. Now, what do you say to people who like look at the pageant world as just like stupid? They're like, why are people going on stage looking good and getting scored? Like what, like what's your response to that? Because people do look down, I'm sure, on that just like they do real estate. But well, what's your response to that? I think it's a common misconception that it's a beauty pageant. So it's only based on how they look and as a result, they must be stupid. Mm. So if you care about your appearance in any way and have any level of self-confidence, you must be stupid. It just, it's this equation that doesn't yeah, compute. Yeah. Um, what I love about pageantry is that it actually at its heart is so based in service. So when I was Miss Nevada, I did nearly 500 community appearances. Holy I mean, I was like sick at the end. Yeah, I was like, yeah. I have really pushed it, but I wanted to, right? And so I was like I said, volunteering in schools, reading in hospitals, working with every nonprofit under the sun. I did a Boys and Girls Club tour of the entire state. Oh. I was on Native American reservations. I yeah. was everywhere. And mostly I was talking with kids. I was meeting like elementary school, middle school, high school aged kids. And so that was my opportunity to talk about my love of reading. That was my opportunity to talk about higher education. Um, that was my opportunity to talk about surrounding yourself with people who support you and love you. Um, so it was really kind of simple messaging because there's no agenda to push. You know, your your public service platform is simply being of service. Um, but I loved that time period because I just got a chance to share like really great things that worked for me in my life. Yeah. How how is a pageant score? Like, how do you win a pageant? Yeah. So. Um, when I competed, everything was weighted evenly. Interview, swimsuit, evening gown, on stage question, they're all weighted evenly 25%. Okay. So if you look at it, 50% of your score is talking, interview, mm. and on stage question. But to get to on stage question, you have to be a finalist. So not everyone gets the on stage question. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So you've got to really, you, you've just got to bring it on every level. Um, I think even, you know, with swimsuit, uh, I think swimsuit's gotten a bad rap over a couple of years with kind of like a woke society of like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, whatever they have to say about yeah. it. What I like about the swimsuit competition is that it shows your level of discipline. Um, it's not easy, right, to get up there and be in a swimsuit and, and portray a level of self-confidence that you're like, I'm here and I'm going to own it. And if you have any self-confidence and self-pride within yourself, you want to look your best. Yeah. You want to look your personal best. So that takes time and effort. Um, and again, though, that's only 25% of your score of, the, of a beauty pageant, yeah. right? So all of it together, you really have to be the whole package. Interview, swimsuit, evening gown, on stage question. Yeah. And then um, really the real work starts after you win. It's, it's what do you do with your year, yeah. right? And some people do, they do photo shoots and they do red carpet, which is all part of it and so much fun. But to this day, nine years later, I still have business relationships, personal relationships, friendships that mm. I made from that one year of busting my tail, traveling around the state and literally volunteering my time. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in this idea that, the reason humans like people who are fit, like the reason we are attracted to a, uh, to fit bodies is because it demonstrates a level of commitment and discipline. Uh, so in other words, if you go like biologically or evolutionary, like when we look at somebody who is in shape, uh, not like super like, uh, you know, sick and unhealthy, right? But they're super in shape. Mm -hmm. It says, hey, that person is committed to the long haul. Uh, I have a theory about beards are the same way. I think that's why beards are generally <laughs> considered more attractive because they demonstrate uh uh, the ability to commit to something for a long period of time. Mm. I could be totally off on that, and I'm, you know, but I'm going to go with that. that, that it, it says, hey, I can commit to something for a long time. So if you're looking for a mate, if you're, you know, like living in, you know, you know, whatever, thousands of years ago, living out in the middle of something, you're looking for a mate, that person is super in shape. It probably says, hey, they can take care of themselves. They can get food for themselves. They can feed themselves and they can feed their family. Therefore, I'm going to be more attracted to them. So I'm, I'm a big believer that we're biologically wired for that. Now we live in a society today, which is, very much we should not glorify good looks in any way because that's going to make people who do not look good feel bad about themselves. Uh, what's your take on that? I mean, like, is, I, like, where where is the line between looking good but not being obsessed with it, looking, uh, letting yourself go per se, you know, and, and just 
being unhealthy, we'll call it. You know, I had a business mentor tell me years ago, he said um, one of his filters for when he works with um, any sort of financial advisor or even a real estate advisor is if they're very overweight, Mm. he won't work with them. Mm. And I was like, what? I was like, what a mean thing to say. What are you talking about? Right. And he was like, no, no, no. Here's a key ring out. He was like, that to me shows their level of dedication and discipline. Mm. He's like, if they don't care enough to take the steps to get themselves healthy, yep. he's like, I'm not going to give them my money. Yeah. And that, I was like, fair enough. Yeah, it's so true. I saw a video the other day from a guy named Andy Elliott. He's a sales coach, uh, trainer guy. I think car, like teaches like car salesman and stuff like that. But he's like super like jacked guy. And he made that statement. He's like, when, when somebody walks into a, a car dealership and there's a guy that looks super good and like in shape, like he's strong. And then there's a guy who's completely overweight. 99% of the time, people will go to the guy who is super in shape. Almost like yeah. subconsciously. Like subconsciously, will right, go to that yeah. person because there's mm. something about like that guy mm. is going to take better care of me mm-hmm. than that guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's whether it's right or wrong, it it is a fact. And so if you're a salesperson, if you're a, a business owner, the, the more in shape you are, people will take you most likely more seriously. And um, yeah, people totally. get offended at me saying that. And it's, it's just... I think it just it comes nature. down to physical health, yeah. right? It's, it's, it's a scientific fact right yeah. it's a biological fact that if you are healthy and and your weight is in a, a i guess a some sort of like you know what works for you right yeah. whatever works for your body you are going to function better yeah right yeah so you have more mental clarity you'll have more stamina you'll be able to execute better yes which just makes you a better all-around human business person all the above yeah we interviewed uh i think it was on the episode ryan kennedy months ago and he said that health is the ultimate like uh like what do you say cheat code it's like mm. business because like what you have good health you have good energy good energy mm-hmm. makes you more likely to get up and go get after business and so right. it helps every area same with sleep the more if you get good sleep you eat good you get enough water you are you have 10 times the energy energy that yep. that everyone else has. So of course yeah. you're going to crush it in business. Yeah. And so why not focus a little bit more on that? So what is your what does health and fitness look like for you today? Like what's your favorite workout? What do you do? How do you eat? What's that like? Yeah, so I love using ClassPass. Um I also I have mm. a personal trainer, but um I love ClassPass because my schedule is so sporadic. Mm. Um and I often travel as well. And so um, I was just like, what is going to work for me of like a very sporadic schedule? And so what I love about class pass is that first off, it's like so cheap. It's like 39 bucks, a month. there's different plans. Yeah. I'm on like yeah. a 39 a month plan. Yeah. Um, and it allows me to just drop into any class that's around me. So if I'm in Dallas, if I'm in San Diego, if I'm in Las Vegas, I can literally drop into a boot camp class or a yoga class or whatever and get my workout in and it's totally fine. That's cool. Yeah. So I love that. Um, and then I also have been doing stem cell treatments, mm. um, and that's been a game changer for me. Um, I didn't know much about it um, until I had a very good friend of mine, Ricky Patel, who actually I went to law school with. Um, and he's a dear, dear friend. He's one of those people that like, I trust him with my life. So like, if he tells you that something's legit, he's also the type of personality that like he researches everything <laughs> before doing anything. So you're like, I know this has I love been thoroughly people. researched, yeah. you know? Yeah. I love people um, like that. And he's, like, he's a phenomenal <laughs> attorney and businessman. Um, but he called me one day and he was like, Hey, Lise, uh, he's like, where is Henderson, Nevada? And I'm like, it's Vegas. It's Southeast Las Vegas. Why? And he was like, oh my gosh. He's like, well, I found this doctor that I really want to go to. He's like, I'm actually going to fly in with my cousin and bring my cousin Chet. And like, we're going to go see this guy. Um, you know, let's have lunch before we go. Let's, let's catch up. And I was like, yeah, for sure. So I go meet him for lunch and he's telling me like all these things. And I'm just like, I'm going, I'm going to your appointment. Like, even if the doctor can't see me, like, so I just want to like be there and meet him and just kind of see what's up, you know? Yeah. So um, Ricky, prior to this, had gone down to Costa Rica and did this very extensive, there's a place, I think it's called Rhythmia. It's like 30 grand for the week. And it's this whole wellness, you know, they're doing stem cells and they're doing all kinds of organic this and, you know, whatever, right? Ton- tons of woo-woo stuff going yeah. on. Um, but it's all for health and, and mental well-being. And he was looking for um, a same kind of high-level treatment in relation to stem cells and exosomes. And he was like looking, 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 and he came across this doctor who happened to be in Henderson, Nevada. And I'm just like, dude, that's a Vegas. Like, what's up? You know? So I ended up meeting the doctor. His name is Dr. Gross. And um, his background is um, he was a spinal surgeon and he's just like a biohacking nerd. Like he's super into biohacking. And so he worked with me and we created this custom biohacking plan. Um, I didn't have any particular ailments around like knee injury or back injury shoulder rotator cuff anything like that 
Um, so he was like, let's just do kind of overall um, well-being. And so it's been a life changer. Like, like I feel... I, I just have more like organic energy. Um, usually I'm like caffeine fiend anyway, yeah, yeah. just to get things done. But like, I just have so much more energy. Um, I feel like I'm more youthful. Um, and like my hairdressers told me, you know, I have less grays, like that kind of stuff, like on the phys- physical side. Yeah. But I think just the mental clarity of just getting that boost because it's literally, um, it's cells that are repairing your cells. So they're changed. It's MRNA, right? They're changing to become the cells that you need. Um, for whatever's damaged it's very like anti-inflammatory so if you have a lot of inflammation in your body it attacks that inflammation and then becomes whatever cells you need so dr gross was saying by the way i like that like dr gross does this on like him and his family too yeah um his wife for example had bad knees from skiing her entire life and before exploring um, meniscus surgery they're like let's do stem cells see what happens injected both her knees 12 months later did an mri she had regrown cartilage Mm. so a lot of his patients um are people who have a specific like i said either rotator cuff meniscus and they come to him before surgery so he's like let's try this before surgery and he's got like a you know he's batting a thousand like these folks don't have to go get surgery because their body ends up regrowing what they need yeah that's cool i think my dad did that actually he had a bad knee and i think he got the stem cell in his knee and yeah it, yeah it took care of that instead of surgery so yeah so it's, good things yeah it's it's really incredible um like i said i'm i'm a big fan of it i'm a big proponent of it um and i've referred many friends and family to this doctor as well but in, i mean in general like you know i think you can find this all around the united states yeah. It is not FDA approved, um, but what that means is that the doctor can't say, oh, Brandon, your shoulder hurts. If I inject you with this, your shoulder will get better. Mm. They can't make any guarantees around it. Um, But um, I I would just encourage anyone, you know, they can look in their area. They can look for stem cell therapy in their area um, and ask questions. Ask the doctor, um, you know, where where do you get your stem cells, right? Because you you can take them from yourself, right? or they come from a facility with a donor, and that's how that's how I, I use mine. Um, what I like about this is Dr. Gross uses a facility out of Colorado, and so I don't know who the donor is, but like they know who the donor is. It's all tracked, right? So it's like a specific donor. Um, the stem cells and exosomes, they come from uh, women after they've given birth. Mm. Uh, the donor is, is a pregnant woman, and they start tracking her from her first trimester, um, and after she gives birth, they harvest the placenta, uh, umbilical cord jelly and um, amniotic fluid and that is how they obtain the stem cells really interesting mm-hmm. and what I also like is that this particular facility in Colorado if the donor the pregnant woman um, has had the vaccine she is no longer an eligible donor oh really and it's because they don't know the long-term mm. effects of the mRNA because it's stem cells are mRNA yep. right so they don't know the long-term effects of uh, the vaccine in yeah. relation to the stem cells. So I thought that was very interesting and frankly, yeah. it gave me some comfort. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. Okay. Um, wow. So, yeah, what, what does it cost for something like that? Stem cell stuff. Um, What's the range? Yeah. So it, it, it depends on the doctor you go to and also what you do. I believe it costs more if you're doing like a site injection for a specific injury. Okay. I do a bag of exosomes, which is around five, $6,000. Okay. Um, and for me, you know, it's it's an investment in my health and well-being. So instead of all the Botox and injectors and fillers and all yeah. that kind of stuff, which can easily cost that, um, I wanted I have my class pass subscription. And I pay a personal trainer and I try to eat as well as I can. And I do this, you know, once every you know six months or so, just to like have a boost and and feel good. Um, Ricky has been doing, um, you know, the DEXA scan where they tell you like the yeah, biological yeah. age of your body. He has gone from, so he, I think he's like 42. Sorry for calling him out. He's like 42. <laughs> when he started the journey, he was like, I think his age was like 44 or something. Yeah. He's now at like 37. Wow. Yeah. So it's like legit, like reverse aging. And again, it's just because it's repairing. It's repairing yourself. It's like, no wonder it's not FDA approved. Yeah. Like the United States doesn't want yeah, you to they, repair yeah. themselves, right? They don't want you to repair they yourself. They want you to buy a drug. Yeah, and they exactly. Want you to, yeah, take exactly. some pills. Yeah. That's so true. What is your relation to real estate investing and real estate in general? Because I know you've got uh, quite a bit of connection there. Yeah. So um, I own the Angle Invokers brokerage here okay. in Las Vegas and Henderson with an amazing partner. Her name's Kathy Quo. And um, we have a great team. They're actually, most of them are, are young women. Okay. Just dynamic young women. Um, and they just slay. They're yeah. amazing. That's um, cool. 
How did and, you end up owning that? Yeah. So, um, so I ran a team at Sotheby's for five okay. and a half years. Okay. Um, as an agent, you were just selling houses and mm-hmm. all that. Okay. So it started when I was working at the firm. Uh, so I had Sin City Cupcakes going yep. still at the firm and mm-hmm. we had clients who had real estate needs and we were referring them out to this like mediocre agents. And I was just like, you guys like, come on, you know what I mean? Plus they were like my clients. So I yeah. felt like a little bit of like ownership over them, yep. like territorial. I was like, I want them to be in the best hands, you know? And so of course every entrepreneur, right. I'm like, I can do the best job. So I go get my real estate license and because I already had a full-time job working at the firm and now had the side hustle of the cupcakes, I teamed up with um, my first real estate partner and um, we ran a team at Sotheby's and he was a full-time broker. And so I was like, look, I've got this book of business. Let's split everything 50, 50. And, um, and I also want to learn the business. So I'm, I, I want to be like an agent, right? Like I want to learn everything too. So I mean, one of the first open houses I did was like an $80,000 condo on the east side. You know what I mean? Like I, I did it. I, I did all the open houses and running around with buyers. And um, I learned the ins and outs of the business of being an agent. Being at um, Sotheby's at the time, great global brand. Um, but the local leadership at that time, um, there was not going to be an opportunity for me to buy into ownership. And I think, again, just coming from the firm and being around business owners, I was like, I know that I want to have equity at some yeah. point, And that wasn't going to be a pathway there. And so I started looking around for other options. Um, and I brought the Christie's brand to Las Vegas, um, had that for two years that got sold off to at properties. And then um, Angle and Vokers is a great global brand. So I bought into the Henderson office, which was already here. And then we expanded to mm. Las Vegas. Very cool. And so do you, are you still involved in showing houses or open houses or any of that stuff anymore? Or are you no, l- better for everyone? Right. <laughs> um, so now as a brokerage owner, my main role is to help train and mentor our agents and also do business development. Mm. So I help bring in, you know, development deals. Um, obviously still have my old book of business from back in the day who I've now, you know, branched out and shared with my partners. Um, and it's just so much fun. I, I enjoy it because I really get this chance to support our agents, which I just really enjoy. Um, and also we have a personal goal of turning all of our agents into real estate investors as well. That's cool. So what about real estate investing? What's your, what's your background there? What do you do there? So I saw my parents doing it while I was growing up a little bit. Um, my dad was a military guy, a U.S. Air Force for 20 years and then Department of Defense for another 20 years. Um, And my mom was stay-at-home mom with me until I was in sixth grade. Um, And then she decided to get her cosmetology license and opened a hair salon. Um, But when I was in elementary school, my mom was like, we need to be buying more real estate. We had, you know, they, my parents had owned the house that we lived in, I grew up in. Um, But when I was in elementary school, my mom convinced my dad to buy their first single family home and they had a long-term tenant in there and so I remember going with my dad to like you know he was like fixing toilets right like the things you do as like a one-man show you know um with tenants and um they started buying up houses uh had long-term tenants in place when I was in middle school my mom again like just the, the foresight sold all the SFRs and bought their first commercial building and it was like off the main drag vacant needed improvement right so they come in they improve it um, put a tenant in it three years later by the time I got into high school they sold that and used that as their down payment on first multifamily oh that's cool so like it takes time right as you know right it takes time and there's a progression there but like it can be done by starting with one house yeah that's so true so you saw your parents do this thing though would you do do you do much of that today yourself or do you just stick with the more of the business side are you buying houses today to yeah to? so i i have a personal portfolio okay. um, mostly here in nevada um but i also help my mom manage their portfolio my dad passed in 2020 and okay. so um i definitely help my mom quite yeah. a bit i'm an only child so yeah there's, i work for free right? <laughs> basically um but no of course happy to do it um and so they have a portfolio between arizona and nevada oh very cool all right. So let's talk about people who are just getting, because I want to talk entrepreneurship a little bit, because I know you've got more entrepreneurial ventures that you've got going. But before we get that, somebody who's listening to the show, they work at W2. Yep. They love the idea of working for themselves. Now, they could become a real estate agent. They could do some other business idea. They could own real estate. They could flip houses. Like, What is your general recommendation if I were to come to you and say, hey, where do I start, Lisa? I'm, I'm stuck. Yeah, I think one of the easiest ways, if you have a good solid W-2 job, like the only reason I wish I still had a W-2 job is because you can so easily get a real estate loan, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Yep. It's so easy yes. for the lenders to approve you for a real estate loan 
for an investor loan, yep. it's 20% down, right? When you have a nice, steady, cushy W-2 job with pay stubs. Yes. Um, so that would be, I think, the easiest segue of like, if you just want to simply diversify your income and assets, use your W-2 job to help you get a real estate loan, yep. buy a property. Use your W-2 job, that steady income that you're getting to help you fund a side hustle. Mm, and do not yeah. quit your job until you know that your side hustle is gonna work for you. I yeah. mean, everyone's got a different level of risk tolerance, but like there's there's something I think powerful in having a steady W-2 job that you can utilize as leverage into these other avenues. 100%, 100% agreed. Oh, when somebody's choosing what to get into, should they follow their passion or should they like, something they 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 love dance so they go do something in the dance field or should they avoid their passion or something else in between I think I've seen success across the board of of all of those different examples mm -hmm. but I do like and I'm going to butcher this I know Mark Cuban says um something along the lines of like don't follow your passion follow your effort mm. and I like that simply because even with the cupcakes right like I wasn't passionate about I wasn't some fantastic home baker Danielle yeah. was but I wasn't passionate about baking. I didn't even know how to bake before we started the company. But I was like, that's a good idea. And, and I was genuinely excited about it. I was like, this is fun. Like yeah. I was genuinely excited about it. So that level of effort and enthusiasm was what got me to help start the company. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, if you're gonna be passionate about something, I mean, I don't, if you, let's say you love baking cakes, right? If you go start a business, you'll probably lose the passion. You'll probably baking. hate it. Yeah, yeah, you'll probably end it. up hating it. Yeah. You'll end up doing a business where yep. you're working with customers and you're yep. dealing with people who don't like their order, yep. right? And you're like, I'm just trying to bake, Yeah. right? So if you, instead you can make your passion. I read this in a book. I wish I remember which book it was so I could give credit, but it said, it said you're not gonna be passionate about that forever, but you will be passionate about money forever. Yeah. And I thought it was like, once yeah. you start making money, it like you could like think of some random object, like, right, I'm gonna go sell dog collars. I wouldn't be passionate about that. I don't mm -hmm. care about dog collars. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I have a profitable business and I'm cranking six figures a month in profit, mm -hmm. suddenly I love dog collars, yeah, right? Like, exactly. like I don't actually care about the collars. I just care about business. And so yeah, being following your passion as long as your passion is business and making money, mm -hmm. you can you can probably do fine. Um, but yeah, I think there's a little danger probably in saying I love baking cake, so therefore I'm gonna make a, a bakery. It, it does work out, like you said. Like sure. you, I've seen yeah. examples too where it's worked out really well. In fact, I I love houses. I still love houses. I still love buying apartments and mobile home parks. Like. That has always been my passion, but you know, it, it it's the business of that yes. thing yep. that I truly fell in love with. Mm -hmm. So what else, what, what came next for you then entrepreneurial wise? I know you've got a lot, you got the VC stuff going, you got the mailbox. I want to talk, talk about all that. So where do we go next? Yeah. So, um, so the venture capital fund is called the veteran fund. Okay. And, um, we're a $20 million fund. It's fund one. And we invest in early stage technology companies that are focused on national security and dual use. And they must have a veteran or military spouse on the leadership team. Explain national security. Mm -hmm. So things like the government are, are yeah, so there's a So the company has a commercial application and they also could have a government application. So our sweet spot as a fund, our value add is helping them get that non-dilutive government funding, get those mm. sweet government contracts. Yeah. That's cool. So, uh, what kind of companies like? What do they make? I don't even know if you can. Uh, maybe it's private, but like, what what are they making? No, it's totally out there. It's okay. on um, Veteran Fund. If you click portfolio, okay. um, we're heading into our ninth investment right now. We've looked at over fourteen hundred deals wow. in the last you know fourteen months or so. Wow. Um, we've made nine investments. That's how. Wow. That, that's the reality of like being a good investor, right? Yeah. You've got to say a lot of no's um, because you have to stay really tight and focused on what your investment thesis is. Um, in our portfolio companies, um, just they're doing cool stuff. Like we've got 3D printed drones. We have 3D printed satellites, wow. data centers on the moon. I mean, <laughs> this is like so next level stuff that I am not an, an expert in, yeah. right? This is not my area of expertise in relation to the technical parts of things. Um, but my strength is one, partnering, right? And then we also have... 52 um, LPs and venture partners who are incredible experts in cybersecurity, in like all these different fields. And so we help, we bring them in to help us do the due diligence as well. Mm -hmm. But being a business person, and certainly from the legal side as well, I mean, you can, you can learn a lot about a company just looking at their books, right? Looking at their run rate, looking at what they spend their money on. Um, it tells you a lot about the company right there. Mm. So out of the nine out of the 1400 that you looked at, what made you choose them? I mean, what is there something, is, was it, yeah, was it their numbers? Were they already profitable? Did you just believe the mission so much or what, what makes you want to fund somebody? Yeah. So, um, 
our sweet spot is the pre-seed level. So that means these companies all have a revenue, but they do not have profit yet. Okay. Um, but we can see a pathway to profitability. Um, but they already have revenue. So this is not like ideation. Mm -hmm. They're coming up with a prototype. Like they've already launched and they have a product out in the marketplace and people are buying it. It's just how do we get more people to buy it? How do we yeah. improve it? How do we tweak it to get the government interested if they're not already interested? Um, so at the pre-seed level, usually we get the most favorable valuations. So we look anywhere to like 6 million, 8 million, 12 cap, somewhere in there. Um, we've gone up to 20 million cap once, um, but staying at that pre-seed level allows our dollar and our investors' dollars to go the furthest by getting the most equity that we can for our investment. Mm, that's really cool. So if I was a company and I wanted to sell, uh, or I wanted to raise capital from somebody, what should I do to pitch you? Like what's going to make you love, like choose yeah. me, I guess. So uh, there's a saying, and I think it's very true. Um, you're not necessarily betting on the horse, you're betting on the jockey. Okay. So of course we want to see a, a company that's, you know, it, exciting and maybe they're first to market or maybe they're best in class. Um, but who's running it? Who's running the show? Oh, you don't have any full-time founders? That's weird, mm. right? Who's actually running this company? Yep. Um, so 100%, you're looking at who's running the company um, and what's their background? How are they running it? Are they a technical founder? If it's a technical company, I want to know that you're a technical founder and that you have the ability to build these things mm. or execute, not that you're constantly having to hire out to make your product because it's not going to be sustainable. That makes a lot of sense. All right. Before we go any further, we are going to throw in an ad for this week's podcast. And as we always do, we donate 100% of the revenue from each ad or from the ads from the show toward a charity of the guest choosing. So what charity or uh, mission, I guess, breaks your heart that you want us to throw some cash toward? Yeah. So there is um, a great nonprofit um, here in town called Nevada Policy Research Institute. And um, they're just, it's really important. They're very much focused on economic policy. Mm. And I know it sounds boring and people are like, what is that? Um, if all of us here are like in business or in real estate or interested in business, you have to be paying attention to policy because policy is the magic laws that legislators decide mm, yes. and then it comes down and rains on us right like oh your business is not essential it has to be closed or you need whatever the regulation is it's literally decided by these elected officials um you may not even know who your elected official is yeah. right that's the crazy part is that in private sector we're so focused on head down and we're busy working on our businesses we don't pop our heads up enough and we don't get involved enough on public sector and then we're surprised when these types of rules and legislations come down that we have to abide by yeah. as law abiding citizens, right? We have to abide by them. So you've got to be paying attention to policy. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Well, let's cue the ad and then we'll donate the money to that. All right. So let's <laughs> talk why veteran real quick. Why you, are you, you did not, you're not in the veteran. You're not a veteran, right? No, I, sure. I did not but serve, dad. but I come from a military family. Okay. Yes. Is, so is that dad. where that comes from? That heart? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. My dad, um, he's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, and like I said, did 20 years U.S. Air Force and then another, tw I think, 22 years working mm. for the DOD. So by the time I came around, my dad was already um, working for the Department of Defense. Um, and I think just growing up in a household that is so um, appreciative and proud to be an American, yeah. um, it just taught me a lot of core values. Um, and I grew up in a small town called Sierra Vista, which is right next to Fort Huachuca, which is an Army intelligence base. And that's where my dad worked for the DOD. Um, and I just, you know, I just think it's so, it, it's just a, such a core part of, of who I am. And so to this day, even like at one of our ship stores, for example, it's right by the base. And so we hire military spouses up there and, um, who, by the way, I think military spouses are entrepreneurs, secret weapon. Oh, really? These ladies are amazing, right? Like they're, so a lot of them take themselves out of the workforce because especially if they're, um, moving around, right, it's every three years, they got to move every three years, yeah. you pack up your entire family and move somewhere new that you've never been to. And um, so in general, it's hard to sustain a career, right? Yep. Forget like holding a regular job. So they'll take themselves out of the workforce. And most of them are college educated. Yep. They're sharp. Like they're just busy, right? They're running a household and moving and doing all the things, especially if their husband's deployed, they're yep. running the household by themselves. Um, and so I love hiring military spouses because in general, they want to work part-time. Um, they are like, 
super on time or early. They like to decorate. Like it just, they're so <laughs> awesome. Like I love the military spouses that work with us. Um, and pro tip, you don't have to pay for their health insurance. Ah. So I'm like, what is this magical part-time employee? That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned, you mentioned the, uh, I think you said mail, the mail center mailbox. Let's talk about that. What is that? So how'd you get into that world? So I started these independent mailbox rental pack and ship stores simply because I was like irritated. Um, I'd had a mailbox that I rented at a local UPS store here in Las Vegas for like, I think I had it for like seven years or something and they'd auto charge my credit card every year. Right. I'd I'd get the charge on my email and I was like, Oh, I need to cancel that. And I never would because it's a pain in the ass to like change your address. And then finally one day I was like, if I am not canceling this, other people are not canceling Mm -hmm. this. Right. So, um, I uh, called a friend of mine who had three UPS franchise stores in San Diego at the time because I was looking at a UPS franchise. And he was like, Lisa, he's like, let me tell you. He's like, if you called my UPS store right now and said, hi, I'm a new mailbox customer. I don't even have a mailbox to give you. He's like, I'm maxed Mm. out. He's like, I have like 310 mailboxes. I'm maxed out. And I was like, you can't put in more? He's like, no, because the franchise dictates my store layout. And I was like, oh. And so he was like, the way this business model works is like, you could have mailboxes as a steady recurring revenue, mini storage units, um, paying your uh, rent and payroll, paying your fixed overhead cost, right? And then the shipping is ancillary and seasonal. And I was like, interesting. He's like, so if I were you, he's like, forget the UPS franchise route. He's like, you got to pay the monthly royalties. There's a monthly marketing fee. He's like, go independent. He is like, then you can con- configure the store however you'd like slamming a thousand mailboxes if you want right and have shipping in the back yeah and i was like love it okay and then i was like well i still don't know anything about running these stores so i go up the street from my house in summerlin to a local independent store called postal pros and that i'd been a patron of for years so i knew the owner his name's andrew and i went to andrew and i said uh do you want to expand and he's like no he's like curmudgeon you know and (laughs) And so i was like well i want to open up one of these down at like 215 russell it's far enough away it's not competition um I will pay you $10,000 if you let me follow you around for two weeks and I'll capture all your processes and make you like a lovely SOP handbook. And he was just like, are you serious? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, all right, fine. <laughs> and so literally the next day I showed up, he unlocked the front door. And the second he unlocked, like literally, to this day, our SOPs start with number one, like unlock the front door. Like, And so I went in and I literally trained in his store for two weeks. Like people thought I was a new hire. I I learned everything. I, I was like, I down to his counter heights, like I, I got SOPs for everything so that way I was able to modify you know and open up my stores but I literally trained in his store for two weeks like customers thought I was a new hire I had one guy tell me he was like you know he's like you're too pretty to work at a shipping store (laughs) and I was like thanks like (laughs) that is genius I've never heard of anybody doing that where it's like I'm going to pay the owner of the company I want to build I'm going to pay them to follow them around, give them an SOP, and I'm going to have my own. Because he didn't have SOPs, yeah. right? He has like yeah, what, most three employees. Most, yeah, he works out like kind of part time ish, right? Yep. He's had this store now like 13 years, and yeah. like, you know, it's just it's just a, a great lifestyle business for him. Yeah. So he was just like, I don't have SOPs. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I will build them for you. Like, I will make it so it's easier for you to train yep. again if you ever need to. Like, that's genius. All right. So, what did you learn? I mean, like. What did you What do you learn about that world of mailboxes? Like, why is that a pro- like? Yeah. Who wants a mailbox? There's Who's so much. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love yeah. it. So, what I love about the mailbox stores is that for the most part, uh, most of our mailbox customers are actually small business owners, like like a side hustle type, where okay, like yeah. maybe they have a W two job, but like they sell Etsy on the side, or they sell Poshmark, or they sell Amazon, or whatever. They sell a Wish, um, and and so they one would like to have a business address because here in nevada for example when you file your paperwork at the secretary of state you must list an address and if you are like a newbie and you don't know what you're doing people end up putting their home address and it's totally public information like you can look it up um so one just for the privacy and protection of using a business address two the convenience um you don't have to worry about your packages so Obviously, we accept all the mail yeah. for our customers and, you know, we sign for FedEx, whatever it is. And so we're able to store it safely. And especially if you're selling online, um, you need a secure place to yeah. send your mail. That's amazing. Do do people, I guess, when they're, you know, using these mailboxes, do they forward their mail somewhere else? Do you forward it on or do they have to come there in person to pick it up or how does that work? Yeah, it depends. So, okay. um 
most of our clientele, I would say the majority of them are super hyper local in the sense they live right around the store. Okay. So um, that's why you can have stores kind of in close proximity to each other and it's not competition because it's so hyper local. Um, your customer base is literally picking up their mail on their way home. Mm. So they want to make it as convenient as possible for them to run in, run out, grab their package or whatever it is. Um, we do have a handful of folks that we forward mail to. And um, some of them, it's because they've moved, but they still need to utilize that address because they still have a Nevada business, sure. um, whatever it is. And so we'll forward sometimes depending on the cadence of whatever they want, you know, biweekly or monthly. Um, but otherwise, we're, we're providing a mailing address that's also a safe, secure place to receive mail. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I think of my, I have a P.O. box. Uh, I've lived in Hawaii now for five years uh, and I still have my P.O. box from, you know, my yeah. old town. And I still, I have my mother-in-law go every two weeks. She goes to get all my mail and yep. then ships it. And I keep telling myself I got to change the address and change the mail. I never do. I just yeah. keep paying the P.O. box. Yeah. Uh, but one thing I like about the system you have, and I'm assuming you don't have to write P.O. box, whatever. You could probably write sweet whatever. Correct. So, so it, it it's actually a street address. Yeah. So if you get a P.O. box with the post office, which is a post office box, right? Yep. If you get a P.O. box with the post office, um, that's all well and good. But in general, they won't accept UPS. They won't accept FedEx. There's a lot of restrictions around those P.O. boxes with an independent store like mine um, or even a UPS store. In general, you will get a street address and then um, you're able to accept all types of carriers and it just makes it easier for the customer. Yeah. And then you you then I'm assuming can choose UP, UPS, FedEx, whatever, and mm -hmm. ship it to wherever you need to. Is that the idea? Yeah. So with an independent store, we actually offer more flexibility for our customers in relation to shipping carriers and shipping rates. If you go to a UPS store, or a FedEx store right now and you say, I want to ship this microphone to New York, yeah. um, UPS is going to give you rates for UPS yep. and also postal service. But they will, in general, have their markup so high on postal service that you will choose the UPS rate yep. and FedEx vice versa. And also you can't drop off at those competing brands either, right? Yeah. Whereas at our independent stores, I don't care if you have a UPS label or FedEx label or stamps on an envelope, you can bring it to my store and the carrier will come pick it up. Yeah, that's wild. I love that. Uh, what does it cost to start a, a, one of these things? So I started two stores with under $60,000. Really? That's mm -hmm. a, that's amazing. And then is there a is there a return on investment you like to you aim for that you think you can achieve or how do you how do you value whether it's worth building one of these and doing one or not? So for me, I knew that it was going to be a long play because like I said, even to this day, I think Andrew's actually in his 14th year now of the 13th or 14th year of business now, but he does a million dollars top line gross out of 1200 square feet with three employees. Wow. Like that's a great lifestyle business, uh -huh. right? So like these are not, you know, you're not going to do $10 million out of a store sure. probably, right? Um, but geez, if you can do 500 grand out of a store, that's yeah. a nice lifestyle business because you're talking 50% margin. Yeah. So I'm okay with that, right? Yeah. And then you start doing them at scale. Um, now you've got a nice lifestyle business that in general is low maintenance, low overhead, low drama. We, we've worked in real estate. Like, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? What I like about these stores is that they're open. My stores are open Monday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. We don't have customers calling us after hours. We don't have emails to deal with after hours. There's no work to take home after mm, hours. Yeah. They just wait till the next business day, right? And the only like drama we have is um, maybe once a quarter, the carrier will lose someone's package. Yeah. It happens, right? Of the, the hundreds and thousands of packages sure. that come through, right? Carrier will lose the package. And of course, the customer comes back to us because they're upset. And we will help them as best as we can. We help them try to get a postage refund from the carrier. Like we do all the things, right? But like that's, that's the drama. Yeah. That's it. Right? That's not too bad. It's not too bad. So one of the, I mean, effectively, one of these properties, or what do you call it, properties, one of these investments, one of these businesses could offer a person full financial freedom just from one of them. 100%. And that's why you see a lot of them as kind of like mom and pop yep. lifestyle, right? There's it, like, once you start paying attention to these independent stores, you'll realize you'll you'll see them around yeah. you. Yeah, I've and seen them all, all the time. I, yeah. yeah, and just go in, right? And in general, I've found it's usually a husband and wife team will be yep. working it. It's an easy lifestyle business for them. Where I do see the opportunity is um, some of these folks are not business people in the yep. sense that they didn't realize that they need to figure out how to scale themselves out of the business. Mm. So they're still working it and they've got like a part time employee who helps and they can't they don't know how to scale themselves out of the business. They yep. don't know how to retire from it. Yeah. And so that could be a really interesting opportunity. Have you ever bought one from somebody? 
Yeah. So I've done some acquisitions. Okay. Um, and what I like about acquiring is exactly that, right? Like you're truly helping them kind of take the next chapter in their life where they're, they're looking to retire. Sure. And they had thought that store was going to be their retirement. Yeah. And it can be. It's just how do we structure yeah. the buyout? So if they can, if you can have a kind of seller financing sort of a situation, exactly, they get income for life, mm-hmm. and then you get a business for very little money down, and right, yeah, that's yeah. very cool. I love it. All right, well, that's that's awesome. So, uh, last question about entrepreneurship is just like, why do you care so much about this? Why do you help people? I mean, I, I follow you on social. You talk a lot about entrepreneurship. Where's that heart for entrepreneurship come from? I just really have a deep, um, I get deep satisfaction out of helping others. And I think it's just because I've been so poured into, um, I've had really incredible mentors and support my entire life. And, um, I just think like if, if you're like, if you've been given to, you know how to give, if you've been loved, you know how to love, like, it's just, it's very reciprocal. Mm, So true. All right, let's move on to the next segment. I call it the three, two, one pivot. And the idea here is that there are things in life that make you pivot, that go a different direction, right? So the three, two, one is three books, two people, and one quote. So we'll start with the books. What are three books that have made an impact on your life and changed the direction? They've made you pivot in your life. Yeah. Three um, books. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm, yes. I know. It, it I saw you on a plane with Robert Kiyosaki the other day. Yeah, what was that amazing. about? Yeah. How do you say that? <laughs> That's amazing. Robert's amazing. Um, do you want to hear that story? Sure. Okay. Let's okay. hear it. Yeah. I so, want to know how you got on a plane with Robert. I met Kiesel. Robert because of Ken McElroy. Okay. Yeah. I met Ken through IPO like okay. years ago, several yeah, years well, ago. Yep. And, um, you know, Ken and Robert are like besties. Yeah. They've been business partners a long time. So when I met Ken, this is like over two years ago, we connected through IPO. Um, he invited me to come down to his podcast. So I jump at the chance, go down to Scottsdale. And um, after the podcast, he's like, hey, we're going to grab some dinner with friends. And I was like, sounds great. His friends were freaking <laughs> Robert Kiyosaki and their amazing doctor, Dr. Nicole Shrednecki, oh, who funny. like I've become good friends with too. And I was just like, am I dreaming? Like, yeah. what, what is happening right now? So just it just goes to show like proximity, yeah. right? Like if you hang out with five potheads, yeah. you'll be the sixth. Yep. If you hang out with five real estate investors, you'll be the sixth. Yeah. Hang out with five business owners, you'll be the sixth. Like, Proximity. That's so true. All right. So Sorry, Robert Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Tribe of Mentors. Okay. Yep. Tim Ferriss. Yep. Love that book. I, I read it often. Um, and Investing in uh, Liquid Assets. I know it's a it's a it's a yeah, book about investing in um, like wine collections. Okay. And I had like found it on a whim at an Airbnb I was staying at in like Vail, That's like funny. randomly years ago. And I was just like reading it and what I like about it is it changed my mindset around mm. asset classes, right? Because when you think assets, you're thinking stocks, real yeah. estate, just kind of the traditional stuff. Yeah. And I was like, this is really interesting. So it really got me just it widened yeah. my horizons for sure. Yeah. I was just chatting with uh, Ryan Pineda about his watch collection stuff and how he invests in watches. Yeah. And I was like, that's something I've never thought about doing before. Right. Uh, but yeah, I know people who invest in wine. I know people who invest in whiskey. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's some interesting things out there. Very cool. All right. So those are the three books. What about two people who have uh, changed the direction of your life? I'm sure it's cliche, but for sure my mom. Sure. Um, just the the level of support and um, kind of like her like hard nosed you know type yeah. of personality too. Um, I remember being young and feeling frustrated because I I got straight A's and I remember it was my freshman year of high school and I got straight A's and this is back when they still put the percentage oh, right yeah. and my mom was like why can't you get a hundred and something? <laughs> and I was just like, what planet are you on? You know what I mean? I was just uh-huh. like, what's wrong with you? Like, like you're so psycho. Right. And I was crying. And my dad, I appreciate this. My dad was like, she holds you to such a high standard mm. because she knows that you're capable. Mm. She was like, so like she thinks you're being lazy because she knows that you, you could get a hundred percent in everything here. Yeah. That's cool. It's good. It's so powerful to have somebody that believes in you too. Like that just, Cause it's oftentimes hard to believe in yourself until somebody else believes in you first. And then mm-hmm. you're like, Oh, like I got, I do have what it takes. And then you rise to the occasion and you get what it's you exactly have what it right. Takes. And you do, right. Yep. It's, I think people don't realize you are totally capable of rising to the occasion. Yeah. You just need someone to be like, you can. Yeah. Yeah. I was a, I was a straight like B student through a uh, freshman and sophomore year, B's and C's uh, freshman and sophomore. And then somebody, I don't know if, yeah, I don't remember who it was, but somebody told me that I was super smart. And mm. I was like, I'm not smart. And they're like, no, you're like really smart. Mm. And I'm like, oh, 
And then I just got straight A's. Nothing. 4.0 my and junior, senior year. And then all of a sudden you're year. super smart. All of a sudden I'm super smart. All it took yeah. was somebody to tell me that I was mm. super smart. Uh, in a similar way, I never thought I was in any way funny until the most popular girl <laughs> in high school, my senior year. Like she was like the prom queen. She wrote in my yearbook, my senior year, when we had, you're the funniest guy I know. And I was like, you're like, I'm I funny. Am? I'm yeah. fun. Like I had no idea. <laughs> and then amazing. I ended up being on a podcast for 10 years, like telling jokes and talking real yeah. estate. I'm like, yeah. oh, maybe I am yeah. uh, funny. So yeah, there's something about people believing in you. 100%. And, yeah, you rise to it. So uh, just more encouragement too, to people listening to this is not just necessarily, uh, you know, you getting told you're smart or funny or whatever, but how can you pour into other people and tell mm-hmm. them, how can you recognize the intelligence or the humor or the, you know, whatever the homemaking, like you are so good at, at whatever, yep. like telling people that uh, we do it to kids all the time. Like, Oh wow. You're so good at that art project mm-hmm. or whatever. But do we do it to our friends? Do we do it to, to our adults? adults? Yeah, yeah. We don't. We don't. Yeah, we really don't. If anything, I think almost human nature with adults is like to criticize, yeah. or like knock you're down. Right. right. And like, that's why I love about our brokerage. Like we're so, we're so all about like empowering each other. And we're very collaborative, mm. um, which a lot of people find like surprising because again, it's mostly women. Um, and we're talking real estate in Las Vegas, right? Yeah. Um, we literally have this giant group text and like, I love that. <laughs> we like drop stuff into each other. Every time someone posts something about how they have something under contract, like if you look at the comments, most of them are our own agents mm. who are like clapping hands yep. or like, you know, it's so encouraging and like you can't buy that level of collaboration and like real enthusiasm of support. Yeah. For sure. All right. That's one person. What other person made a big impact on your life? I would say most recently, Ken. Okay. Um, like I said, we met years ago, um, again, through YPO. So again, proximity. But what I love about Ken in particular is that he's just always positive. Yeah. He's he's so solution oriented. Like he always like figures stuff out. And of course, we all have things going on, right? Just crazy business stuff. And I mean, I've called him with like the sky is falling. Yep. Right. And he literally is like, OK, well, like. And he'll just be solution oriented about yep. it and then like crack some joke yep. or you're just like, Ken, okay. I don't need this right now. You know what I mean? You're just like, can you be serious for one second? I'm trying to like, you know, get a deal done. I remember I called him one time um, and I was looking at a deal. Uh, it was here in town and I was really, I was hesitant on it, but I really liked it. And I said something about like, you know, for this price though, it's it's like the whole kit and caboodle. And I said that and we're going on and on way into the conversation. He's like, but wait, wait, is it the kit? Or is it the, the caboodle. caboodle? And I was just like, God, you know what I mean? Like, I was like, you're not listening to me. But like, I just appreciate he made me stop because I was so frantic. Mm. And I yeah. was like, I was just frantic. And and he stopped me with humor and was just like, just slow down for a second. He was like, no, no one's going to die. Like, everything's fine. Just take a breather for a second. And so I just appreciate how he handles stressful situations. That's phenomenal. Yeah, Ken actually, uh, I would put him as like a pivot on my life twice because I read ABCs of Real Estate Investing mm, yeah. uh, from Ken McElroy. I read that and then the next day I was having a conversation with somebody and they're like, oh, I have an apartment we want to sell and then <gasps> I'm buying their apartment oh, uh, wow. and that got me into multifamily, got me Amazing. into, like, got me out of my job. Like it was reading Ken's book. I would not have bought that property had it not been for Ken. And then uh, last year uh, we were trying to raise like $120 million for a big real estate way, like a six apartment complexes under contract and I was struggling mm-hmm. like how am I going to do this and so mm-hmm. I went out to lunch with Ken and again he was like yeah try this do this and he we did exactly he what he said so easy, yeah so right? simple <laughs> yeah we, we revamped the entire way open door capital does deals and, and wow. uh, into kind of an infinite model which is what he does mm-hmm. and it, people loved it and then we raised the money and it was like Thanks, Ken. Thanks, like, Ken. Yeah, yeah, he's never asked anything in for in return. He just he's just a giver. So. Totally. Yeah, good man. All right, last thing uh, on this section, uh, one pivot quote. So one quote that maybe you live by or that you you love or that changed the direction of your life a little bit. This is a quote my parents have told me since I was young, and it's ring true every time in my life. Um, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. Mm, that's great. That's great. All right, next segment is called Past, Present, Future. First, we start with past. What is your advice to your younger self? Don't be scared to disappoint your parents. I had so much expectation on me around, you know, the law school and, and work in my good law firm job. And um, when I decided to leave the firm to pursue cupcakes and real estate and these other endeavors, um, my mom was really upset with me. She was mm. really upset. And that was really hard on me because I don't like fighting with my parents, obviously. Um, that was really hard on me. Um, and it made me question my judgment. It made me question if I was like good enough to 
to do it. And um, I'm glad that I stuck to it. And of course, now she tells people like the cupcakes yeah, were yeah. her idea. Yeah, and yeah, I'm like, course. I can hear you. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, up until a few years ago, my dad would still say, you know, you could have gone to law school because I took the LSAT mm-hmm. and I was getting ready to go to law school. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely disappointed them a little bit, but I think it worked out okay. Yeah for both of us. <laughs> uh, second, the present. So past, present, future, present. Uh, what is something that you are currently doing, maybe that you've recently adopted into your life that's given you a better life? So something that you've, yeah, could be a habit, trait, action, something you yeah. do. Yeah, well, I know we've, um, we touched on the stem cells a little bit. Okay, I yep. think just, you know, kind of paying attention to health and wellness and also along with that, the mental well-being. Yeah. Um, I started this with my forum. Um, we've been doing uh, three items that we're grateful for each day in a group text. Oh, cool. And it's just changed the way I think about my day, yeah. which I appreciate because there's always something, you know. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, let's let's jump into YPO just for a minute before I get to the future question. But uh, what is YPO for those who don't know? And what, yeah. what kind of impact has it made on you? YPO is a, a global business organization and it's called the Young Presidents Organization. Um, and it is a, it's a peer group. Um, it's not like networking. It's actually very strict no, non-solicitation. Um, and within the chapter, so for example, I'm on the board of the Las Vegas chapter. Um, within the chapters, you have what's called a forum. And that's a smaller group of people that are within the chapter. And in your forum, you have um, no competition. You don't have anyone in the same field as you. And you essentially end up with like a personal board of advisors. Um, these are folks who they've accomplished so much in business. So you respect them automatically just because of what they've built and what they have. Have, yeah. but then um, you end up with this personal board of advisors that you can go to with business issues, even personal issues, and it's folks who are not your business partner, not your best friend, not your significant other. Um, it's a really incredible uh, sounding board of people who have helped me through major decisions that I've had to make over the years. That's cool. Yeah, real. I hear really good things about YPO and EO, and there's a few of them that are just yeah. If EO has the yep. same thing, the forum format, and yep. my my real estate partner Kathy's also an EO here, mm. and same thing, right? It's like you get so much out of your forum experience because of that very sa- and it's a very strict privacy confidentiality. Yep. So, um, like I said, you end up with a personal board of advisors, basically. And there's like a net worth requirement in there, right? Or a, or a business yeah, requirement? Yeah, so EO, um, I think the revenue requirement's a million dollars. Um, and YPO revenue requirement's 13 million. Okay. Uh, but that yeah. can change per chapter as well. So okay. I, think, I think Miami is like something crazy. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, yeah I bet. <laughs> There's a couple of places where it's like, you know, really, really, really high. Um, but the global network that you also get access to, um, there's a back end called YPO Connect, almost like a, like a LinkedIn, but it's like just YPO. Um, and what I did was I went through and I just looked up members that were kind of in close proximity to Las Vegas. Um, and I cold DM'd them on LinkedIn, like found them on LinkedIn. That's how I met Ken. I oh, cold DM'd <laughs> Ken McElroy on LinkedIn and introduced myself, this is years ago, as a, as a new YPO Las Vegas member. And I saw that he was in YPO and that I just wanted to stay connected. If I could ever be a Las Vegas resource, please reach out. It's, literally, it's a copy and paste. Yeah. I sent it to, I don't know, hundreds of YPO people. And Ken was one of the people that wrote me back and was like, hey, like, looked at your LinkedIn. You look really interesting. I have a podcast. Let me know if you ever want to come down on the podcast. Oh, uh, that's cool. And that's how it started. That's amazing. I love that. Uh, yeah, when I started the the Better Life you know, tribe that I've got, it was kind of an idea of like, can I do what they do in EO and YPO, mm-hmm. but at a, at a lower uh, barrier to entry. So people yeah. who are just trying to buy their, you know, yeah. rentals or build mailbox companies, like it was yeah. kind of the same idea. So we have, we don't call them forums, but we have, you know, pods mm-hmm. and be able to meet them. Same idea, but just for a lower I love price that. entry. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's so it, having a peer group is so valuable. So valuable. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and before I got into YPO, you know, um, I had, I was in YEC, which is the Young Entrepreneurs mm-hmm. yep. Council. And that's where I met Cody Sanchez, like yep. all these folks back in the day. This is before, yeah, this before is before Cody anyone was, was YouTube Cody. famous. Yep. You know what I mean? Like this is like back in the day when we were still in the grind phase. Yep. We'd hit a million in revenue in our respective businesses, but we were we were still building, right? Yes. We're, we're trying to get to five million. We're trying to get to like, we're still grinding, yeah. you know, figuring it out. And yeah. it was so valuable to have a peer group. Yeah, love it. Uh, future question, what do you want your legacy to be? I want to hopefully just impact as many folks as possible. And I think that's what I love about the mailboxes, what I've done and, and created that e-course like almost by accident. Yeah. Um, uh, so it's, this e-course that I created of how to start your own independent store and three of my early testers have already started their own stores <laughs> from awesome. scratch. That's like it's awful. so amazing, right? So I love that it's like literally birthing new small business owners 
um, these are entrepreneurs who are like taking their life into their own hands, yeah. you know, and it's just so cool. Yeah, well, that, that relates to the next question, which is what are you excited about? And kind of the wrap up section here, what are you excited about? Is that the thing, the e-course? Definitely the e-course, just because it's, like I said, we, so we have about 200 students in there right wow. now. Um, and literally, these are folks who are like, they're making their own store. Yeah. Like, it's so cool. Um, and definitely the fund, the work that we do at the Veteran Fund, it's so important and impactful. And I just, I'm so grateful that I get to be part of it. Yeah, very, very cool. All right, last question from me. Where can people best follow you at? Where do you want them to follow yeah, you? Yeah, I'm on all the social channels, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, um, at Lisa Song Sutton. And my website is lisasongsutton.com. I love it. Well, thank you, Lisa. You're amazing. Really appreciate you. Thank you so much.